Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father God, on this uh, beautiful and uh, wonderful day, uh, I'd just like to lift uh, Pastor Izzy up in your message this morning uh, so that it, it reaches us each uh, where we are today and, and helps us hear what we need, Lord, in our specific walk and with our specific challenges, with our specific blessings. Lord, just that we may be, may do, uh, be better equipped to do your work. Father, um, we thank you just to be here on this uh, wonderful location. Um, Father, we thank you for this word that we're about to receive. And uh, Lord, we just ask you to keep your hand on us. Keep guiding us forward to you, Lord. This, this we ask in, your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, if you would turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We just got to the first verse of the chapter, and it is a wonderful declaration that tells us something about the Lord that I don't know, not, not everyone came up with the same, you know, spiritual upbringing. So some folks, this is one of the words in the scripture I find that is um, to the ones that have didn't get to grow up going to church, didn't get to grow up knowing things that the scriptures tell us about God. This is one of the foundational truths. If you're ever sharing with someone who um, maybe they're, it's all new to them, they haven't you know been exposed to the gospel, they don't know about it, this is a great place to introduce them to uh, an attribute that God shares about himself with us. And John, John is going to record it for us. And remember, John said he had seen these things, he had heard them, his hands had actually handled this word concerning, this word of life, he said. It was Jesus. He was there. He actually was the one, the man writing this is the man who leaned on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. He's that, anyone want to be that close to the Lord? You've you know, where were you at the last supper? I was leaning on him. You know, he was right there. And so when John writes these words, to me, these have an even greater significance because this is the guy who was leaning on the Lord there at that last supper. He's the one who writes about himself in third person when he writes the gospel of John. He says, the disciple whom Jesus, what? Loved. loved. That's me. You know, he said that's now, by the way, couldn't all of us write the disciple whom Jesus loved? The disciple means a follower. Anyone who follows the Lord, does the Lord love you? Well, let's find that out this morning. Let's look at first John chapter three, verse one. It says, see how how great a love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And such we are. He says, for this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. But beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. This is one of the truths that John knew because he was there. He was when, in fact, he was there. If we read in the book of Acts, when Jesus was after he had risen and he had over the course of many days presented himself alive, from the grave, it says that the, the uh, heavens were opened and the disciples were standing there and the angels actually said to the disciples, why, men of Galilee, do you stand there with your, with your mouth unhinged? You know, gawking is, is the word we put it into in English. But, I mean, they literally, their jaws dropped. I, I, you know, the angels are like, why are you, why are you, why is your jaw dropping? Don't you know that this Jesus that you have seen? Now, what, what did they just see? Now, wait a minute. you got to go to the story. What happened that their jaw was dropping? And why were they standing there looking up like this? And, 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 and what were they watching? What took place there in the book of Acts that made this, this reaction happen? Well, the scripture says the skies were opened and Jesus was taken up. You guys have heard this part, right? He ascended to the right hand of who? Of, the, of God the Father. He went up and he took his place in heaven. Now some people, when they talk about heaven, they talk about heaven like it's really far away. But I submit to you that heaven is not far away. It's just veiled 
from our perception. It could be right behind this, you know, it'd be like being at a movie theater. And you got the screen there, and they're projecting the, this, this scene, you know, with, with all the boats and the, and, the, and the clouds and the sky and water. And, and you're looking at it going, oh, isn't that a beautiful scenery right there? And you see the scene, and, and if we were in the theater looking, you, by the way, they do that on the mainland at churches. They, they, they project this on their wall so that they can pretend that they have this for their scene. We have the real deal. But picture in your mind that you're in the theater and you're looking at this scene, and someone comes from behind the screen and takes a blade and cuts through the screen and opens it up. And from behind the screen, you see there this one radiant white, just brilliant white. And, and it, the description in the book of Revelation of God is even, even his light is so, so magnificent. You know, within light are all the different, um, well, if you take a prism, that little triangular piece of glass and crystal, and you put the light, sunlight into it, what happens to it as it passes through that? It refracts and, and it, it breaks apart into the different spectrums. And you see those, what we call the colors of the rainbow, as the light is separated. But the Bible describes that God's perfect light will create bows round about him. I, I don't know how exactly it will be, but his light is so pure, so full, so bright, that, I don't know, if he just moves his arm like this and all of a sudden rainbows over here just, whoo, you know. And, and he, 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 you know, he looks over this way and, and the whole shift of light changes and all the all the colors of light all radiating around him. Now, if someone like that cut the screen of the sky and peeled it back and you saw him, what would you do? <laughs> this is what happened. I mean, th these guys actually had this happen. They, th God peeled the sky open and they went, oh. And the angel spoke to them. Do you not know that this Jesus, whom you have just seen go, to the Father, will in like manner do what, what, what's going to happen in like manner? He's going to come again. And what happens when we read the book? The kids on the, on the college and career group, they want me to teach them the book of Revelation. And so they're all excited. Let's do the book of Revelation. Let's do the book. And in the book of Revelation, you guys that are students of the word, you know that it says the, the, the blast of the trump of the angel will blow and, and, and it says the sky will be what? rent in two it will be like that curtain peeled open and there will come jesus radiant white light just shining forth and he'll have written on his thigh what king of kings and lord of what of lords now when i was a kid i always pictured a, a sash you know like a robe with a fancy things like went down the side but I was listening to one of our Tongan brothers teach this at the, one of the conferences, and he says, you know, Jesus is going to have tattoo. <laughs> and I said, where did he get that? You know, and he says, because, you know, it, it, he pulled up his, his, his shorts a little bit, and he had one of those tribal tattoos, the ones with all the triangles going down, and this is my grand, great-grandfather, this one represents my, right, and all the way down, that was his lineage tattooed to the side of, it was big. His leg was big, you know? <laughs> And he says, Jesus is no wimp. He's going to have right on the side of his thigh. King of kings, Lord of lords, written. And I went home right away. I'm like, where does it say that? I gotta. So I looked it up in Greek. And you know what? There's no sash. The sash part was something somebody put, uh, an artist painted that. Somewhere back in like the, it, 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 in, in Michelangelo's day, they put that artistic rendition and that's what i had seen so in my mind's eye i always pictured the sash but the book doesn't say there's a sash the book says written on his thigh so don't get into shock <laughs> if you get there and jesus has a tattoo <laughs> i mean that might freak some of you out because i know you're like no way no tattoos but but if the boss has one you might have to change your position i mean i don't have tattoos i Extra pain, needles, I hate needles, you know. Can't do that voluntarily, but, but if he has one, all right. Because he's allowed to. He's the boss. And, and his has great significance, doesn't it? King of kings, Lord of lords. And he will come, and that sky, when it peels open and he comes, he's riding on something. Do you guys remember what he's riding? A white 
flying horse. This is the part I always share about my daughter, Joy. She loved horses. And she was like, Daddy, are there going to be animals in heaven? I said, yes, honey. Is our dog going to be in heaven? You know, that's always the, the next question. You've got to tell them the truth. The scripture doesn't say whether your dog will be in heaven or not. What it does say is the animals that are going to be there, they are upgraded. Like horses, not regular riding around on the ground horses. They fly. Anyone up for a flying horse? Oh, by the way, who's following the Lord when he comes back and the sky is open? Is, he doesn't come by himself. It says there's myriads, ten thousands of ten thousands. Are we, in English we translate, that, that's the Hebrew way of saying millions. Ten thousands of ten thousands. Hundreds of thousands of believers will be flying on horses behind him. And he will come, and he, it says he will slay the, the wicked with a sword, a word that comes out of his what? Out of his mouth. Just a word. I, I, you know, I grew up in a military family. They're all poised for fight. And then I think this is like the ultimate fight between good and evil. And how much fighting does Jesus' whole army do? Basically nothing. They just ride horses. Fly around. Whoa, watch the, hey, this is a great viewpoint, man, watch this. And there goes our general. And he ain't like the generals down here on earth who send all the boys into battle. Our general does what? He leads. And he's going to go and he's going to fight against wickedness and he's going to take it out. And I go, oh, right, man. This is, I mean, and we're just going to be spectators from what I can tell. I mean, I look, anyone look forward to riding on one of them horses besides me? And when the kids ask you, do they have animals? Yes. And read Revelations. They got even more awesome critters. They got ones that have a face of a lion and of a, an of a eagle and a bear and a man all on one creature. One facing what we call to the point of the, of the compass to the north, one to the south, one to the east, one to the west. And they don't, that creature doesn't even have to turn its head. Why? It's got eyes on every side, man. It's covered. It can see all around and it just moves. It's by the spirit. Whichever way the spirit hovers and, and moves, the whole thing just whoop, whoop. And like, you think sci fi is where, where, where these guys are created? Read the book of Revelation. What the Lord has created is it's just, it's going to, we're going to be going, wow, you are awesome, God, of the stuff that you make. Upgrades. Upgrades for certain. But here's what John, the man who stood, he, now I'm only trying to put you in, the, in, the, in his shoes. He leaned on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. He called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he stood there, and I believe his, his jaw was one of the unhinged ones, you know. And he saw Jesus taken up to the right hand of the Father. And this is what he wants to tell. This is what he wants to tell us. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. How great is his love? He says that we should be called the robots of God. And such we are. No. That we should be called the, the peons and servants and, um, right? Is that what it says? What, what do we get to be called? Children. The children, the sons. We're a, we're call, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray in Matthew 6, he said, pray in this manner. Our Father, which are in where? Heaven. In heaven. Hallowed be thy name. High and lifted up is your name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth, as it is in heaven. Now he said, pray in this manner. When you start off your prayers, anyone ever wonder, why do we pray our Father when we start our prayers? And by the way, so when the kids ask, why do we always end in Jesus' name? Do you remember that in John's gospel? Jesus, John wrote this for us in his gospel. He said, whenever you ask anything, ask in whose name? In Jesus' name, uh, that you might receive. He says, you guys, you haven't tried this, but, but if you try this, watch what happens when you ask the Father anything in my name, Jesus said, and it will be done for you, and your joy will be made what? Full. 
Anybody like to get answered prayers? Is it nice when you pray and you get an answer? Like, and me personally, since I'm so good at waiting, I like the fast answer, you know? Lord, could I have this? Boom, there you go. Thanks, Lord. You know, some things I prayed for and it didn't happen right away. Does that mean quit praying? No. It means continue to pray and, and wait to see. You know, we sang that psalm, Psalm 40 this morning. I waited for the Lord on high. I waited and he heard my what? My cry. David declared he waited on the Lord. There, you know, th and that word wait there in Hebrew, it's, it's a, a waiting with, with an expectation of the guy I'm waiting for that I'm crying out to. He has the ability. He has the power. He has the resources. He has everything necessary to answer that petition that I'm crying out to him about. He's got it all covered. I'm not waiting with, I hope God could do something. I'm not really sure if he could, or maybe if he's in a good mood, or I get him on the right day. No, he's not fickle like earthly fathers. See, when John's writing this, he says, see how great a love God has toward us, that we are called his children. And the the, in the scriptures, it, what, what Paul writes, and also we don't know the author of Hebrews, but the author of Hebrews also makes mention that we get to cry out by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, what God gives to us, to God, this beautiful four-letter word. It's from the Hebrew. Starts with an A, ends with an A. Anyone know the two letters in between? B and B. Abba. Does so anyone know what Abba means in Hebrew? It means father or it really means dada. It's the equivalent of our dada, daddy. Like, like the, first, the first utterings of a little child when they, when they cry out to their dad, dada. They're not, hey, father. You know, the little kid doesn't go, father, I address you as my father. No, he goes, dada. Or in Hebrew, abba. Abba. That's, a, that's an intimate relationship between you and your father. That's the relationship John says, how great a love God has toward us that we get to have an intimate relationship where we call dad, well, dad, dad. Who are we calling dad, dad? Our heavenly father. Now maybe you didn't have a good relation with your earthly father and didn't feel a closeness to him or maybe you never even knew him. But this is one of the things that John says we have that we get the, the privilege of, of calling upon God as our heavenly father. He's there for us. Now it says, we don't know, it says in verse two, it has not appeared to us yet what we shall be. All we know is when he appears, what's gonna happen to us? When, when that veil does peel back, the sky is rent and, and Christ appears, what will happen to all the believers? In the moment what we see him, what's it say in First Thessalonians? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall be made like him. This corruption will put on what? Incorruption. This mortal shell that you got, you're upgrading. Anyone ready for this one? Yeah. Incorruption, immortality. We're going to be swallowed up. It says death will be swallowed up with what? Life. Life everlasting. When we see the Lord, we'll be like, changed poof faster than a twinkle a twinkles how fast light refracts off your eye you ever seen a twinkle in someone's eye just that little glint of light just just so fast just a a flash just a, that's how fast we're going to be changed now for those of you that struggle with pain in your body or like our brother steve who's fighting cancer right now there's one thing steve does know that at the end of this, he's going to be changed. And he's, he, see, I've known Steve for a long time. His faith is real solid. This guy knows that even if we don't get to live till the coming of the day of the Lord, but we die, the Bible says if we believe in him, even though we die, we do not die. We what? We live. And in 2 Corinthians, we read at the end of chapter 4 into chapter 5 that this momentary light affliction is producing in us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. 
God is working something to last for eternity. And I know he's worked that in my brother Steve. Because Steve's going, I don't care, man. If this shell fails, I get a new one. He, he knows it, doesn't he? Holland was with me. We were visiting him. He, he's like, man, I'm ready to go. I mean, he'll stay as long as God wants him to stay. But he's, but he's fully assured that as soon as his spirit leaves this earthly body, this tent, Paul calls it, it gets upgraded to a what? A mansion. Not made by human hands. A building made by God. Now some people think that building is an actual like mansion like we think of on earth. But I think Paul's trying to relate the relationship between this thing we're dwelling in right now that my spirit is in, this earthly body that is called a tent. Talk about a nice word picture, right? He says, this is a tent for my spirit. You see what you're looking at right here, guys? Look at my tent. It's just a tent. By the way, I'm pretty sure it doesn't quite line up with what is on the inside. Because every day I look in that mirror and I'm like, you're much better looking than that. <laughs> Something is wrong. The tent is failing. The, the, the thing is, you know, like, it, it, tents are okay for a while. If you've camped a bit, you know. They're fine, especially when the tent is new and all of the, the zippers on the tent are working and everything. But once they've been rolled up a few times, a little dirt's got in them, a little sand, and they get, you know, sometimes a little wind tweaks them and twists them and a little pole snaps here or there and you like tape it back together and patch it up and gets a little leak. Anyone feel like your, your, your body, that tent, what Paul calls it, is getting a few leaks? A, a, a few break, you know, little, little, little stuff going wrong. See, Paul says you get to have a body made by God. This is how great a love God has for us. Now, when people hear this, there's something about our spirit inside that knows that God has made us with a purpose of eternity. It says he, he, he put it in us, this part of us. That is, we don't do death well at all. Because we're not intended to die. We're intended to live with him. But not in these temporal bodies. Just like, like the, the, when they saw Christ resurrected, he, his body had been changed. They saw it. And they saw his, his visage actually change. And they, they were like, whoa, look at this guy. In fact, before he died, three of the guys, does anyone remember the three fellows that went up to the Mount of it's called the Mount of Transfiguration. They went up with Jesus. And Jesus was, he knew his time was coming to go to the cross. Who met with Jesus that day on the mount? Do you remember? Two, two really important guys from the Old Testament. Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the law. Elijah, the prophets. And these two visited with Jesus on the mount. And Jesus brought his inner circle, they were called. Peter James and one other guy. Guess. Just guess. Just happened to be talking about him today. John. And while they were there, it says that Jesus began to visit with Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah, if you know your Bible, those guys have been dead for a long time, right? I mean, they had walked on the earth many thousands of years prior, but here's Jesus talking to them, which tells me, after you die, are you really gone? I mean, you cease to exist. The whole teaching of you just turn into nirvana and just nothingness and it's a blip of darkness and you enter, that's baloney. After you die, your spirit still lives. And these, these two came and they spoke to Jesus. And Jesus, it says, was transfigured. In other words, his visage changed from his earthly countenance this earthly tent, into what? what? What happened to his whole body? What started happening? A little change there? They should put this in the movies, I think, you know. Why don't they do this one? This Spielberg needs to make a part with this. Because what happened to Jesus, it says in the scripture, his visage was changed to radiant light. He just shined. They were like, he's brighter than the sun at high noon. He's just, just gleaming. And so was Moses and Elijah, by the way. They were all white, bright light. And Peter, he's like, oh, excuse me, Lord, it's a good thing we're here. We 
we should build three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And Jesus is like, shh, don't tell anyone about this till after I'm gone. Till after I have what? Ascended. Don't tell about this. You got a little sneak peek. Anyone here, would, would that boost your faith at all? Little, just a little sneak peek. You know, why is it when someone dies and they, they're gone a while and they come back? That all of a sudden, all of the news reporters want to get an interview with them and say, so, what did you see? Was there light? Was there a tunnel? What was it, you know, what, and interestingly enough, that the, the, these are different people's encounters with, with life, they don't call it death, life after death. So we don't die. We live. It's just where are you going to live? You were created by God to spend eternity with him. But God will not make you do it. He has granted to you a free will. And although he's made the way for you to come to be with him, he doesn't force you to be. Because being forced would be, well, it's not real love. If, if he forced you to come to, 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 to be with him, you'd be like a robot. And this verse would not be here. It would be, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we are the robots of God. <laughs> and such we are. We have no choice. He made us with no choice. We have to go be with him. And What if we don't want to be? Well, too bad, we're robots. That's what it would be. He'd be a dictator, right? But he's a father, a heavenly father, who John says loves us so much he calls us his children. He says, you're my children. Now, although it does not appear exactly what we shall be, it says we do know that when he appears, we shall be made like who? Like him. So I can tell you with just full assurance that you're going to be upgraded. Because when Peter and James and John talk about the transfiguration, they were freaked out. They were like, whoa, that was an upgrade. I mean... He was shining bright, and, and wasn't that, and I mean, Peter was so excited, he wanted to build tabernacles. You know what that is, like, like little tent houses there. Let's build a, a, I'm like, Peter, we didn't do charge a mission? I mean, this is where Jesus changed right in front of us, and Moses was there, and Elijah was there. We'll make one for each of them, then they can go first to this one, and then to that one, the three, three shekels each, you know, one for each, no, two for Jesus's, and one for Moses, one for Elijah. Was he in charge? I mean, what was he? Th it must have been something so exciting. He didn't even know what to. He ever been so excited you say something stupid? <laughs> Wet socks, Peter. Open mouth, insert foot. You know, that's Peter. He, he comes up with some real doozies sometimes in the scripture. By the way, this is what makes me appreciate the Bible even more, is that these guys were real men. It doesn't hold any, you know, Things like, uh, if, this was a f if this was a fable, if this was an untrue story, they would not tell you these little details about these guys doing these stupid things. You know? They wouldn't. Because if it was like science fiction, they'd be like, hey, these are great guys, man. They're, you know, they're, the, they're the A team. They're the A apostles. They're part of God squad, you know? They're just the right guy. And they would have had all great stories about them. But John, even John is quick to point out, you know, when we were going to the tomb, me and Peter, we, 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 we ran together. But I, I mean, I'm sorry, the disciple whom Jesus loved <laughs> outran Peter and got there first. You guys know that right at the end of the Gospel of John. He doesn't just mention it once that he got there first, but a couple times just to throw it in there. I'm the faster runner. But he was slow and steady. And when he finally, I was standing by the door waiting, you know, about time he got here, Peter. And Peter went right in, saw the, the cloth and the head cloth folded in his, and then I went in and checked it out, you know, you know, of course. And, but I was the faster runner. I did get there first. He has to say it again. This guy who's proud that he's fast when it comes to outrunning Peter also realized that God has called us to be his children. 
And that's a very unique thing to understand in your Christian faith is that we have a God that loves you so much. He's invited you to be one of his kids. And though you might have had a bad earthly experience down here, maybe you had, you know, you were rejected. Maybe you, you never knew your earthly parents. Let me tell you, you have a heavenly father that can trump any love that you get down here. His love is so complete toward us. And his plan for us is so, well, it's just marvelous. The more I learn about it, the more I, I, I think, this is the best job in the world. I get to tell you these great discoveries of the hope we have, because the Bible says the hope we have is that we're going to have everlasting life. But we don't just get to find out that we get everlasting life. We get to find out we get upgrades. Our bodies get upgraded to incorruptible, immortal, our our. Well, our pets, I'll call them. I'm thinking they get it. Uh, if we get an upgrades, they're getting upgrades. I'm wondering what our dog Oreo will look like in heaven. <laughs> Just, I mean, if God could upgrade us. Now, I know that guys will say there's no, the animals have no soul. They're not going to be there. Okay, fine. Then God's going to have a better one. That's what I think. Because he, sh he does describe creatures that will be in heaven, and they are way beyond what we got down here. So I'm pretty sure we're covered. Maybe they wouldn't be good for up there. You know, our earthly ones, they, they'd need a transformation just like we will need a transformation. So God's got that. I don't even worry about that. It says we don't even know what will be, but we know when he appears. This we do know. We will be made what? Like him. That part is the part you need to focus on. So many times the devil likes to get us to, to wonder about things, what we don't know. That's a distraction, right? Isn't that like a best form of distraction? Get you, get you wrapped up with something you don't know. Get you like fumbling over stuff you don't even know. Instead of focusing on what we do know. We do know that when he appears, we will be made like him. Now, is there any sin in Christ? Is there any death in Christ? No, it's all been conquered. He took care of it. He said it's finished done so do i have to worry how about pain bodily pain do you think when we get to heaven we're gonna have to worry about these achy joints and the my, my joints are so accurate when rain is coming that my kids know this for a fact i just if if as soon as it starts to stiffen up my hand where i can't close it real easy all the joints in my hand stiffen and then if it goes to that sharp pain of an, uh, like someone's taking an ice pick and sticking it between my joints that means we only have about a minute Okay, and it's very accurate. I mean, I hate to, I, I, I'm not boasting in how fun this is. It sucks. Oops, can I say that at church? It, it's, it, it really doesn't feel good. My bones hurt, and, and when it's, you know, I'll tell my kids, get out there and get the towels off the rail and get the, you know, <laughs> pick the stuff up you don't want wet in the yard because this rain is coming. And they used to go, yeah, well, I'll get to it in a minute, Dad. You know, in a, you know how kids do, in a minute. In a minute, they know when I say rain's coming, like hurry, that means not in a minute. Go do it. That means go now. If you want it to stay dry, get it quick. Because this body has whatever that is that feels that barometric pressure change when rain is coming in. Anyone else feel that, by the way? Uh, anyone else here have joints that you can, yeah, or you have an injury? I know, I, I hear this about people who have injuries where they have broken a bone, and in the spot where the bone mended, they actually feel a pressure, a pain. I'm like, I must just have busted too much of everything because it hurts like in a bunch of places. <coughs> and I, I read that even though I don't know what I will be, I know I will be like him. And I am pretty sure that that incorruptible body, that immortal body, is not going to be able to feel pain like the pain I feel when the, when the weather is changing. I might be able to tell you rain is coming, but hopefully by then it's not going to be because I, I have this internal pain meter it's going off, just going, pain, pain, hurry, it's going to rain. You know? And I, I don't like it. I, like, uh, uh. I have to like s shock the joint to make it stop hurting. I'm not going to have to do that in heaven. I used to freak my wife out. 
I'd be upstairs going, she's like, uh-oh, he's mad. I'm not mad. My joints hurt. I'm trying to get it to stop. It just, it's the only thing that, you know, a little extra sting and it kind of may loosens them up again. Oh, whew, there I can move my hand again. And when you when you like to play instruments like I do, it really stinks to have your joints freeze up. It's, I, I don't know what I'll be like, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have to deal with my joints freezing up when I want to play the music. When I'm in my heavenly body, I am so excited, guys. Now, I'm going to just do one more verse. Verse 3 of John, 1 John 3. 1 John 3, 3 says this, that everyone that has this hope fixed on him, it says purifies himself. Just as he is pure. This is one thing we know about Christ. He is pure. When I said there's no sin in him, none. There's no darkness, no shifting of shadows. He is pure light, pure love. He's pure righteousness. That's Christ. But every one of us that has what hope? The hope that someday we will see him and we'll be made what? Like him. Every, and who has that hope here? Just raise your hand if you have the hope of, of that day coming where you're going to be seeing the Lord and be changed. Okay, now, every one of us that has that hope in our heart, the Bible says that hope purifies us. You say, well, how can it purify you? Easy. I'm sitting here preaching to you that the Lord will come with a with the sound, the blast of a, an angel. How many of you heard that trump? That the, the scripture says that trumpet will blast. His, an angelic trumpet. I was teaching this to the kids on Friday night, and Kainoa took his phone and he was waving. He had set it to angelic trumpet sound. And I was telling the kids, guys, we were we were doing a preview of this sermon right here. And I was telling the kids, guys, someday my hope is I'm going to be telling you this would be the greatest way to go out. I mean, for this preacher, would be that, I, I, I'm more a teacher, but, but I would be telling the people that someday, we don't know the day or hour, the Bible says, we know the signs of the times. Anyone think we got the signs of the times getting close? You know, the whole, Jesus said, there'll be wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, famines, earthquakes, all these things. There'll be like a woman in travail, a woman getting ready to give birth. The, the signs of these things, like, like how about earthquakes? How, how, many, how many earthquakes have we been having? The Bible says that, that Jesus himself said that his coming will be marked by this. The earthquakes will become like a woman when she goes into labor. You know, when she goes into labor, the contractions, they get closer and closer together. And the intensity of the contractions, what happens to them? They get stronger, right? What's happening to the, what's happening to the, the earth right now? I found it very interesting listening to a secular geologists saying it's as if the earth is going into labor we're having more and more of these earthquakes in the and the and the intensity of each episode he called it episode i don't know that's like is that a geological term or something each contraction is like stronger and longer and this is his description and i'm thinking i wonder if he even knows that jesus said this because I'm pretty sure Jesus preceded this dude to at least walk in on this earth by about 2,000 years. And this guy is, you know, a professor telling his students, it is as if the earth is going into labor. We have the signs of the times that Jesus spoke of. And Jesus said, when you see these signs, what are we supposed to do with our eyes? We're supposed to look up because our redemption draws near. The Lord's coming could be any time. I want to be telling you guys about the Lord's return. And then as we finish the sermon, before I pick up my guitar for the closing song, a blast of a trump of an angel would blow. Right? And we'll all, it says, what, what will happen to the believers when we see him? We're, we're made like him, but we'll also be caught up to meet him in the air. You guys know he's flying in, right? I, I did mention that. The flying thing, the horse. Where'd... Our, our rendezvous point isn't going to be down here. Now, for all of us young men that grew up watching comic strips and you know, reading you know, Superman, anyone here want to fly? 
I mean, does that sound like? Forget roller coasters. I like roller coasters, but to be caught up to meet the Lord, to fly. I mean, when I when I first became a Christian, it was the end of the the Jesus people movement. They called it the 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 um, late seventies. Is it, they, they used to go, we, we used to say, uh, rapture drill. You know, that, that rapture means the, the catching up to be with the Lord. And, and we would all jump up. If someone yelled rapture drill, we all jumped like Superman. We're taking off. Rapture drill. Just getting ready, you know, in case the Lord blows the trump. Jump. I don't know that we had to jump to get a launch, you know. Since we're going to be caught up. To be, but how many of you believe the Lord will catch us up to be with him? He's just going to go. Come on, guys, you're done. And we're, I mean, I've been waiting for this hope. It's been about 35 years I've been waiting for this hope. And so I said, well, it hasn't happened for 35 years. probably never going to happen. I'm like, I got news for you. If a woman goes into labor and the contractions start getting closer and longer and stronger and, and then she has a, a, a little relief where it kind of mellows for Maybe, you know, she gets a, a, a breather. Just <laughs> Sometimes it's a short breather. But, but let's say she gets a, even an hour where, just, where, 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 where it slows down enough that she's like catching her breath. And does she go, well, the baby's never going to come. Right, ladies? Is that what you're thinking? Or are you just thinking, thank God I got a break for a second? Because you know what's coming, right? It's going to intensify more, and it's, the baby is coming. When I say the Lord is coming, I am 35 years closer to his return than when I first believed. And for you to tell me, I don't think he's going to come because you've been waiting this long, is like me saying, listen, I've been bedside with some gal in labor, and it was a long, long labor, and you can't convince me the baby ain't coming. I just know that the longer that I had to wait for that baby to come, the closer I am to its imminent arrival. It will get here. Just like the Lord will get here. Now, everyone that has that hope that the Lord will return purifies their heart. And I want your heart to be pure. I want you to be ready for his return. In fact, I know that it says we don't know the day or the hour. No man knows it. Jesus said even the Son of God himself did not know it. Who is the only person privy to when Jesus will be sent back? Who is the one person that we started this message off with? Our Heavenly Father. And why won't he tell us exactly when? <laughs> she just said it. He wants to make sure we keep our hearts pure. Because if we knew, like let's say we knew it was going to be next Sunday he's coming back. The Bible says our hearts are desperately wicked. Who can know? I mean, if we knew we had a whole week, now not that you would ever say this, I'll just confess it for me, okay? And you can count it if it works. But we go, sin like crazy for Monday to Saturday. Sunday morning we'll get right again. You know, sin is good for a season. Let's go blow out. Right? Let's that, our hearts are desperately wicked. Don't fool yourself. You know, when I hear people say, oh, they have such a good heart. I said, lies. Because you know why I say that? Because a lot of them say it about me. And I live in here. And I'm like, mm-mm. But I do know something about myself that because my God has promised me this great hope of sending his son back for us, and because he didn't let me know exactly when, it keeps me on my toes. It has this really interesting around the backside way of keeping me from venturing into some areas of sin maybe that I would be easily sucked into because when the sin, the, the temptation for the sin presents itself, you know, it can be right in front of me. And you know what will happen? The, the temptation is there and God's spirit is also there. And his spirit will just whisper, <clears throat> you know, you've been waiting 35 years. Are the contractions le letting up? Like, no. You think we're getting closer? Yeah. Didn't you used to think it would be any day, any minute? Yeah. 
So let me get this right. 35 years later, and you think it's going to take longer now? No. You could be here any second. It could be any second the Lord could return. And truly, I do want to end with this today that, you know, I tell you that he could come any second, and then the trump blows, and he comes. <laughs> and we're all caught up to heaven, and for us to eternity, be like, didn't I tell you guys? That is the best way to go out. That would be the pinnacle of my sermon ever the greatest sermon ever is telling you get ready for the return of the Lord. now if in your heart you when i'm talking about christ returning for his bride you say oh please don't come yet lord maybe you don't say it out loud but inwardly you, you know like you're not excited like i am about his idea of his coming and you're going i uh, uh, not yet i got a few things we need to you know work on a little some stuff not quite right what you just did was identify the areas of sin in your life that you need to get right with God. Because there should be nothing that you have to shrink away in shame from Him at His coming unless you have something that you're doing in sin. See, the Bible does say there will be those that will shrink away in shame. Because... When he comes, that light will expose their darkness. And I don't want you to wait till it's too late to get right. I want you to take this hope of his coming and get right now. So that you look forward like I do to his return and you're just like, I can't wait. Bring it up. I remember when Pastor Chuck Smith used to say, this was in 1979, I don't know if we're going to make it to 1980. Do you remember that? And then 81 and 82. And, but we were just like hanging on, just like it could be, this could be the last year we have a New Year's. We don't know how much longer we have. There was so much ec excitement, anticipation, because the signs of the times were starting to really ramp up. And that was 35 plus years ago. I submit to you, the signs are ramping up even more, but the Christians have become dull in their hearing. They've gone, yeah, it's been a long time. He's probably never going to, this is never going to get over with. It's like the woman that walks into the Super Bowl with all the guys are watching Super Bowl. And she, she's like, they've been watching this game for like four hours. Isn't this game like, a, like four, 15 minutes? She's trying to get it, you know, a handle on the football thing. Is it, how long is a quarter, honey, of football? For those of you football fans, how long, how many minutes of play is that? 15, 15 right? We got a one-hour game. Now, she comes in at four hours and 20 minutes and like, honey, this is never going to be over with. And it's on the last two-minute, the two-minute uh, warning has just gone off, you know? Which, by the way, Two minutes left on the clock. How much time really is left? <laughs> till, till we actually, 15, 20 minutes, sometimes half an hour. I don't know how that they can pull a half an hour out of two minutes, but they do it. Overtime, you know, timeouts, all the stuff. That, and, they ju and you may be saying inside, this is never going to be over with if you're, if you're the one that's not a fan. Now, if you're a fan of the game, you relish in that last two minutes because they really milk it. And maybe it's going back and forth in the last two minutes and you're just like hanging on the edge of your seat because you don't know. You're just, you're just enjoying the moment. Let me tell you what, you're not going to enjoy your Christian walk if you do not have the right hope for your faith. And John wanted to make sure that you would have that. So he tells you, you are called God's sons, his children. And we don't know what we'll be like, but we know we will be like who? Like him. And he will come again, and that hope will purify your heart. Everyone who has the hope of his coming, you, whether you realize it or not, that hope will help you. You might be tempted to sin, and the Spirit of God will say, I could come now. Jesus might be coming. And remember, we don't know what day or hour. Could be right now. Do you, is that what you want to be doing when he gets back? You laugh at me because uh, I don't know if I should ask for a show of hands on this one, but anyone else ever had that thought go across your scanner? 
Like when you're about to sin and God just kind of pulls that one out of the hat. So is that the last thing you want to be do found doing on earth? You know, when my son gets back? You talk about a thought that purifies your heart. There it is right there. I mean, that's a zinger if there is ever. I mean, you're like tempted to sin and God goes, I could send my son right now. Would you like that? And you're like, uh, maybe we should pass on this. That is the hope we have. Don't lose that hope. Don't let go of that hope. Don't think heaven is so far away and God's return of his son is so far away. I submit to you after 35 plus years of studying this book, I can't find you one more prophecy that, n that is necessary to be fulfilled before the return of his son. I, can't, I mean, and I'm pretty much a student of this book. I submit to you, we are on the last throes. We, we are so close. And yet, the Bible says, in the last days, the love of many will wax what? Cold. The, the, that love of God will just wax cold in their heart. They'll, they'll lose it. Anyone of you know any folks that used to Serve the Lord alongside you, shoulder to shoulder. They were on fire for the Lord. And today they're just, well, can't be bothered to go to church. Got other things to do now. They've backslidden. Yesterday at men's prayer, we were praying that all the backslidden, all the backslidden Christians, like the prophet cried out in the Old Testament, come ye back to the Lord, you backslidden of heart. Did you know that that's a prophetic call that the prophet called out? He said, come back to the Lord. Come back to... What would happen if every Christian that you know that has kind of fallen back would come back to serving the Lord right now? What would happen to church? Um, well, we wouldn't have to really worry about overflow seating. We got plenty of room on the beach. Just throw down a few extra towels. And but some churches, they'd be, they'd be packed out. They wouldn't have any room. I believe there's more backsliders in Hawaii than probably anywhere else. It seems like we collect them. They come from all over the world and they go, I'm going to go to Hawaii. It's like heaven on earth. In fact, I don't even need to go to church anymore. This is just like heaven. Yeah, that's it. And whether they realize it or not, they slide away from following the Lord with their whole heart. And they're the ones... Now, th this message might not be f so much for you today, but it might be for one of them that you're going to run into. And one of you may be able to share with them, are you ready for the Lord to return? You know, think about it. You might have a brother or a cousin, someone who once followed the Lord with their whole heart, and, and they've kind of lost that fervor. That fire has started to go out. And you're thinking, how can I stir up that that fire once again. How can I help them to, to, to have that refreshing, that rekindling of their faith? You know what you do? You know, what do we do to a fire when it's going out? You get out the fire poker, right? What do you do? Whack it around a little, stir it up, get the coals up to the top, right? Dust off all the ash. And then what do you do? Throw some fresh wood. Put some more kindling on that thing. Crank it up, man. You get the, and you feed that thing and it comes back to life. I submit to you, the life of the spirit that we're studying right now, this is, a, this, is a, this is like wood that spiritually will kindle a fire in someone. But they, their fire might be going way out. And you need to remind them, the Lord could come back. Are you ready? And they're, they, they've, been, they've been putting out the fire. They've been sinning, quenching the spirit of God. And you're going, no, nope, oh, no, no, stop that. Quit pouring water on your fire. We need to, we need to change that. We got to put some gasoline on that thing. We got to put you back on. Let, let's get you lit up again. And guys, I don't think we have much time. I think we need to burn bright for the Lord. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. They see your good works and they glorify your Father in heaven. Be shining for the Lord. We, I think the times are short. Does anyone agree with me that times feel like they're getting shorter? I don't know the day or hour, but I would ask that if you don't mind as we close in prayer, that the Lord could honor my prayer and just come now. Anyone be okay with that? <laughs> if we just ended on a good note, the trump blow right right as we close, that would, I, I mean, I'm, I would like to go out that way. 
I could tell Holland for all of eternity, didn't I tell you, Holland? It's a good day. By the way, let's pray. Father, even as the very last prayer of the whole Bible found in Revelation, you, you had the Apostle John to pen these words. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. May we have that sink into our hearts, Lord. Come quickly. And may your grace be with us all. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? We'll sing a closing song and let you go in the grace and the peace of the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.